There we go. All right. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I'm your host, Krista Porter, over here on the side here, um, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the commission's weekly online event, um, a webinar, webcast, online show, um, the terminology for what you call these things is up for debate. Some people have strong feelings about what they don't determine what they do and don't want to use. But whatever you call us, we are an online show. We're here live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. If you're unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. We do record the show every week, and you can go to our website and watch our recordings. Um, we have recordings going back to the very beginning of the show, actually, which was uh, January 2009 was the first uh, show. So you can go back and watch everything. Um, we post the recordings onto our YouTube account. If there's any present PowerPoint presentations, as we have this morning, um, those will be included. And any websites that are mentioned, we save into our delicious account online, so you can have access to those afterwards as well. Um, we do a mixture of things here on the show, uh, book reviews, mini training sessions, um, interviews, uh, website tours. Uh, basically, our only criteria is that it's something library related, something libraries are doing, something they're involved in, something that might be of interest to them. Uh, so some of our topics you might think are a little out of the box. Uh, you might wonder sometimes, uh, why is that on the show? But Trust us, everything comes around to libraries in some way. That's my criteria. <laughs> That's really the only criteria. <laughs> um, we do have Nebraska Library Commission staff, since we are hosted here by the Nebraska Library Commission, that come on and do um, uh, shows sometimes, um, but we also bring in, bring in guest speakers, and that's what we have this morning, as you can see on the slide there. Um, bed bugs in the library is what we're going to be talking about this morning, and as far as I know, we don't have any to display or show. We didn't bring any examples <laughs> except for in picture <laughs> form, so good for that. Um, <laughs> You're happy about that? Yes, I think my, my, my supervisor would not be happy if that was going to be Live demonstrations, no. Um, um, this is a session that's actually done at our state library conference last fall, and I believe you've done it elsewhere as well. Um, and it was recommended to me by multiple people. I did not attend your session there, but it was multiple, recommended to me by multiple people to have it on the show because it was something very interesting and useful and something a lot of libraries are having to deal with. So um, we have with us uh, Julie Bino and Katie Murtha, who are from our um, Lincoln City Libraries <laughs> um, here in Lincoln, Nebraska, and Dr. Jody Green right next to me, who's from the um, Nebraska Extension Office here based in Lincoln as well. Yeah, right? Yeah. Down the street. So um, they're going to tell us all about the wonderful world of bed bugs and how we can get rid of them, not have them at all. Mm -hmm. Protect ourselves. <laughs> Protect ourselves, yeah. <laughs> so, um, try, you try to use the mouse to click on the slides first. There we go. And then you should be able Oops. to. There we go. There Oops. we go. All right. Sorry. Previous. This is just our agenda, real quick, for the day. Um, we are going to short start out with the video, and I'll turn it over to Katie. Okay. Just like that. All right, hang on. We're going to have to turn the volume up on that a bit. We'll get the volume up a little higher for you so you can hear it. I turned it down earlier when we were testing things. So. And this is very typical of kind of what we go through when we've had to deal with bed bugs, and that's why we included this little clip. It's from Orange is the New Black. Yes, if you're a fan of the show. Or Black is the New Orange. Orange, <laughs> orange is the New Black. <laughs> Um, if you're a fan of the show, you might recognize this name. Hey, Judy! Calm down. We're not replacing any books. We're not losing any. Listen to that right then. Bed bug. That ain't no bed bug. That's a muffin crumb. Why are you going to tell the expert what that is? Ain't like I'm not an expert at muffin. Think about these bastards. Once they're in, the only way to get them out is wipe out their nooks and crannies. Don't you think just spray some stuff in here? Steam the books or something? Tell me, ain't What you think, Mr. Pluto? 100% sure. 75%. I'm sure you would have done some nothing for me. 90%. Oh, put that one down. Not sure. Have a <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> I 
I'm down to like 50 50. <laughs> So we don't ever eat bed bugs, but we do have a lot of times where we're passing the book back and forth and asking, what do you think this is? So we'll turn it over to Dr. Um, Green, and she'll be able to tell you a little bit more about bed bugs. Thanks. Yeah. There we go. So I'm going to talk about um, bed bug biology. Um, but we'll first talk, uh, about, talk about their distribution. So they're distributed worldwide, reported in all 50 states. They did have, um, they were around a long time ago before like the World War, and after World War II and the um, invention of DDT, there was a huge decline in the population to the point where it was kind of a myth that even bed bugs existed. Um, I know my generation didn't ever see a bed bug mm -hmm. um, growing up, and the, the, the line, good night, sleep tight, don't let the bed bugs bite, mm -hmm. was kind of just a cute little saying. And since the 1980s, uh, there's been an increase, and even in the last, you know, 10 years, uh, a huge increase. A lot of reports, um, uh, and they're showing up everywhere. Do you know why it came back, or like what happened that made it suddenly? I don't know why. Oh. Ah, okay. Uh oh. Oh dear. Oh. All right. Maybe I shouldn't help. <laughs> Well, some of the reasons why um, we think is increased travel. We're just able to go to many places yeah, in the yeah. same day, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we take all our belongings with us, especially our outerwear and our bags. Um, our pest control practices are, I guess, a little more environmentally friendly, which makes mm -hmm. it a little, um, there's less pesticide around to kill any residual bugs that are around. So when we used to spray a lot of DDT for cockroaches and mosquitoes and whatnot, um, nowadays we don't do that. So mm -hmm. any bed bugs that are there hiding cracks and crevices won't be, you know, killed off accidentally. Um, there's a lack of awareness, which is a big problem. People don't know bed bugs exist, so you don't mm -hmm. pr protect against them. You don't look for them, inspect them. Um, so that increases the problem. And um, insecticide resistance is a problem because of all the pesticide use over the years. Um, the bed bugs have evolved to have a, a thicker exoskeleton or cuticle, um, it's a waxier exoskeleton, and so pen um, the insecticide don't doesn't penetrate as much into the cuticle mm. to affect them. And then they've also, um, scientists have shown that they have evolved faster metabolism, so even if it does get into their system, mm. they're able to um, detoxify and uh, get that out of their system faster. Mm. So we'll talk about um, how to, how what they look like. I don't know if sure. it's a delay or... So the human bed bug um, is a pest of humans. So um, they are, it's an, in, it's an insect, and it's in the order Hemiptera, and um, we call those half wings. Uh, the suborder is Heteroptera, and you might know them as a true bug. Entomologists call things by their order. Um, you know, we've got beetles and we've got flies, but this one is actually a true bug. And you might know some true bugs, like stink bugs or harlowing wind bugs, uh, box elder bugs, milkweed bugs. Um, the bottom uh, right one there is a, like a leaf-footed bug, which is a, an overwinterer. So when you see those, they sometimes come into the house. Mm -hmm. They are all characterized by their um, piercing, sucking mouth part, which they hold underneath their body, um, and it kind of looks like a beak. Um, so that's something they all have in common. Um, and a bed bug is no exception. So this is the uh, ventral side of a bed bug. So they're underside, um, two different bed bugs. Um, and you can see they've got this, um, th this mouth part. And so it's kind of just like a straw. So they pierce into the skin or the plant, whatever they are, um, whatever they feed on. And most of them are plant feeders. There are some predatory ones and bed bugs are one of them. Um, their scientific name is Cemex lectularis, which means bed or couch. Um, to identify these, uh, the, so this is an adult bed bug. Um, its general shape is oval. We call them dorsoventrally compressed, which just means they're flattened from the top. If you see a bed bug, sometimes they are like thin and like paper. Um, they are about a reddish brown. Sometimes people call it mahogany. Um, and adults can grow up to about a uh, quarter of an inch, and um, the only problem with that is that 
that's an adult bed bug. So there are very um, a various a number of sizes that are smaller than that, and so they're different size ovals. And then this is the same bed bug, an adult, and on the left you can see that that one's pretty oval, and then on the right, on the right that one's elongated and engorged. And that is the difference between a hungry bed bug and a full bed bug. So, yeah, so even the same bed bug in a different feeding status will look very different. When you put one of the true bugs under the microscope to try to find out if it is indeed a bed bug, these are some of its uh, identifying features. It has vestigial wings, which means they do not function. They're actually, they're not there, so they do not fly. So that is a big, um, uh, it's, it's very important. If someone sees an, an insect flying by, it's not a bed bug. Um, it's got a three-segmented beak, four-segmented antenna, and it has um, golden hairs all over its body. I, I do want to talk a little bit about their, um, the way they mate. It's a process called traumatic insemination, and this is where the male bed bug pierces the female's abdominal wall with its external genitalia. Sounds pretty gory, and it, and it kind of is. Harsh. And he inseminates <laughs> right into the body cavity. And so the sperm travels um, eventually to the ovaries where it does fertilize the egg. Um, there are adaptations in the female exoskeleton to uh, make that area or that wound heal faster. So, you know, the, um, that's part of evolution. Um, and that is one of the big stories of uh, com sexual conflict between males and females in the, in the, um, the I guess, biology. So what that does for the male is it ensures that his sperm is the one to fertilize the eggs because it's the last sperm in that actually counts. Mm -hmm. And the female doesn't want to mate with multiple partners because it is so traumatic to her. So, and um, after she has a blood meal, which she, um, she needs to be able to lay these eggs, she lays these eggs individually, um, two to five per day. And they're glued onto surfaces, um, such as you know, uh, luggage, bed, clothing. Um, and they hatch anywhere between 7 to 12 days after they're laid. And in her lifetime, she can lay 200 to 500 eggs. Um, bed bugs undergo incomplete metamorphosis. So they go from egg nymph to adult. Um, that's very different from like a caterpillar or something that goes through complete metamorphosis where they've got a larvae and then a dormant phase. So these guys are active the entire time. And a nymph is just a smaller version of an adult um, under um, normal, I guess, environmental conditions. Uh, we say their life cycle could go from, you know, five to six weeks. Um, here is their life cycle chart. It doesn't like me. Um, so it starts off as an egg, and we'll see that if that's about a clock, it's around two o'clock. So the eggs will hatch, and they will um, hatch into the first instar nip. And an instar is just a phase of development. And so each, um, there are five stages of development or instars before the bed bug becomes an adult. Between each of those, the nymph requires a blood meal. And so, um, you know, unlike mosquitoes, where it's only the female that requires a blood meal for egg, all forms of bed bugs do require um, uh, food in the form of blood. Um, so between each of those, it needs to molt because it is an insect and has an exoskeleton. So it sheds that exoskeleton each time. And uh, this is a good diagram because it shows what the, um, which each uh, instar looks like fed and um, hungry, and then the difference in sizes between um, male and female. In the, the top picture is what a bed bug looks like when it's shedding its skin, and the bottom is the exoskeleton that's left behind, and you can see that mouth part, you can see the antenna, and you can actually see that the hind gut, and there's a little bit of blood left in there. Try the down arrow, see if that works better. No? Oh, here. I just use the mouse then. Okay. Sorry, everybody. Mm. Oh, no. That's okay. There we go. Um, the rate of growth and development is really dependent on food and temperature. You know, in order to survive for any pest, it needs food, water, and shelter. Um, they get food and water from our blood because they are their blood feeders. And then they, you know, they find shelter close to where we are. Um, they can undergo three to four generations per year, 
and their lifespan is typically 6 to 12 months. Under optical, optimal conditions, which is about 70 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, which is, you know, the temperature we live at, their life cycle can be completed from egg to adult um, egg-laying female um, in one month. And I just put a little note at the bottom that there are some temperatures that are lethal, so that would be zero degrees for four days and uh, over 120 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 minutes. Uh, this picture here um, is a uh, couple bed bugs with an apple seed. Um, many times we compare the shape and the size and the color to apple seeds. So um, there's one for comparison. Um, sometimes people bring in things that look exactly like a bed bug, but if you put them under a microscope, you will see that it's not a bed bug. And this is important because a bed bug and the eastern bat bug look very similar, mm -hmm. except you can see the, the length of the hair on the bat bug are much longer. Um, a lot of times they say if if the length of the hair is longer than the diameter of the eye. And I just think, well, it's kind of, um, it's longer hair. It's long, beautiful hair. And then I started singing the, the hair musical. But the, uh, the bat bug, it's important to be able to identify what, if it's a bat bug or a bed bug, because the bat bug primarily feeds on bats. And so they're going to feed, you know, differently. They're going to live somewhere else, mainly in attics. The behavior differences when you find one, it could be on your bed, but it might not be living and have a whole aggregation in your bed. So um, the treatment differences, you don't want anyone spraying close to your bed or treating your bed. You want to be able to remove the bats and, um, you know, treat the, the proper locations. Um, here's just a picture of a bunch of bat bugs and then one, um, a full body bat bug and bed bug. And you'll just see um, probably better on the, the computer screen that one's just a lot hairier. Mm. Um, so the necessity for survival is going to be food. It's going to be blood. Um, how do they detect us? Well, uh, we can't stop breathing, and they can detect us by our body heat, carbon dioxide, and our human scent. Um, it, they can um, consume up to three times their body weight in blood. And if you, uh, I mean, if you ever want to look at something gross, you can. There's a there's there's a bunch of YouTube videos. To, you can just watch them go <laughs> from this flat insect to a totally engorged um, um, bug. Um, and it usually takes bet anywhere between 3 and 12 minutes for them to get that blood meal. Um, their feeding behavior is not um, daily. The adults will feed every 3 to 5 days. Um, and they'll typically feed on exposed skin while the host is sleeping. Um, and if you, know, if you work uh, nights, they can adjust their schedule to, um, to meet yours so they can get their food. They do not um, bite the scalp, though, because they just are not adapted to be able to navigate through the hair. They do inject compounds that aid in feeding, similar to you know other um, blood feeders, so that your blood doesn't uh, coagulate and clot, so they can get that out. Um, the reactions of hosts, um, sometimes it's a delayed reaction, sometimes it's right away, sometimes there's no reaction. Um, it could result in like itchy red welts, bumps, hives, um, people react in all different kinds of ways. And again, 30% um, of the population don't react, which is part of the reason it, it could get out of hand before we know we have a problem. Um, the photo there is on the right. That's actually of, of my risk, this one time that I fed bed bugs. And I had a, a delayed reaction of a week. And then uh, after I fed a bed bug again, I swelled up right away really badly. And I never did that again. <laughs> Learned my lesson. <laughs> um, now, it says that you said they don't navigate hair very well. Does that mean they wouldn't be able to affect your pets? Um, because of the fur? They or? don't usually feed on pets. Okay. I know people have found them on their dog, but it's mm -hmm. not something that they're like living on there. They might have fallen on the dog, okay. but um, yeah. Um, maybe in the absence of a human, they might get something, something normal because yeah. they need you know, for survival. So post meal, what they're doing, and the reason why they only feed every five days or might, you might not see them is because most of the time they're resting and digesting. So they're hiding somewhere in a crack or crevice close to where you're sleeping and where you live so that they can digest and molt. So the nymphs will molt to the next instar and the adult female will lay eggs. And this is the period of time where they kind of just, you know, wander onto things and they hitchhike. Um, because they don't fly or jump, you know, they're just going to walk onto things and we're the ones carrying them around. Um, a lot of times they'll go back to their aggregation site or they'll find a new, um, a new site close to their hosts. And that could be a couch, could be a bed. Um, the adults and nymphs live together. When there are great populations, they can emit a very strong odor. Um, I can't really describe the odor. It's a really sweet kind of peaky smell, like it's, but it's sweet. Mm -hmm. um, their harborage will contain fecal stains. They eat blood, so they will poop out blood. There'll be a lot of dark um, spots. You will 
likely see a lot of eggs, um, those shed exoskeletons or skins, and um, some, some live bugs running around in there. Um, the places that you want to check um, are around the bed, so it's not just the mattress. You want to check the box spring. You want to check all the places. Some of these pictures here, you'll see the tag on the mattress, the um, the tacking that's glued or uh, stapled to the bottom of the box spring. That those corner guards are good places to hide. You want to typically check anywhere that's undisturbed. So you know if if you're changing your sheets all the time, like a hotel, it's not typically going to be the top mattress. Um, any upholstered furniture next um, next to the bed or in the bedroom, your nightstand, um, you know, a lot of places. So you're going to look for those those dark marks and those cast skin. And so how do we bring them into our houses? Well, sometimes we travel. A lot of times we have purses, bags, computer bags, diaper bags. Um, and we put those down places and they can crawl on. Um, here's just an example of, you know, eggs stuck or a little bed bug stuck to uh, the zipper of a bag. And so the bed bug comes off when you get to your house and could feed on you. <laughs> and, you know, maybe you got a book nearby. <laughs> And so this is when the library gets involved. Thank you, Jody. You're welcome. You can switch back to your yep. presentation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Should be able to. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, and then just get it. There you go. Okay, so um, in 2002 or 12, I had a customer come in, and it was the first time a customer ever asked me could you get bed bugs from a library book? And I had never heard of that. I did a quick Google search, um, and I didn't really see anything. And I kind of gave them, you know, the, oh, well, we don't have that issue here. It might happen. But um, two years later, we actually had an introduction um, where somebody dropped off books in our book drop uh, that were infested with bed bugs. And we talk about an introduction versus an infestation. We've never had an infestation at Lincoln City Libraries. Um, the first time it happened, uh, the way our circulation desk is set up, there's a, a spot for customers to return the books, and then we pick them up from that um, spot and put them on carts. And then as we have time, we go through and check them in. And so these books were on a cart for a little bit. Um, you know, they're, they're mixed in with other returns from other customers. And when we were finally getting to them, we started looking at these books, and they were um, – you know, there, there were a lot of food stains on them to begin with, but then there were, you know, other things that we thought, this is really strange. They felt really tacky. Um, and then um, the bugs started kind of coming out. And then it was kind of pandemonium at the at the circulation desk because no one wanted to touch them. Um, everybody was kind of like, what's going on? And so we realized that these books just couldn't be treated the same way we treat most damaged items. Mm -hmm. Um, we weren't sure what exactly it was, although somebody guessed that it was a bed bug, so that's when we got the county extension office involved and we um, you know, asked them to look at it and to actually make that identification. And then after, after that, um, we decided to form a committee because there were so many issues and problems dealing with these books. Like I said, they just weren't typical damaged books. All right, some of the things that libraries need to consider are policy considerations, um, providing training and determining best practices for staff, how to treat materials, um, determining workflow procedures and letting customers know, and providing information to the public. Um, we invited Jody here because it's very important for us to know what a bed bug looks like in all the different stages. Um, at Lincoln City Libraries, we have large posters in all of the back rooms showing the different life stages of bed bugs. Um, so that staff can be aware of what they look like. It's really important that staff get past the itching stage when you see a bed bug. You have to stay calm and know what to do. So we will talk about all these different stages that we went through. So one of the first things we, we dealt with were policy considerations. Like, well, what are we going to do with these materials that come back? Um, because in this case, we had two sets. We had the books that were in, you know, we thought were um, obviously in had some sort of bed bug damage to them. But then there were also books that were just sitting on the cart next to them. Mm -hmm. And bed bugs are hitchhikers. So they could have crawled out from one book to the other. So um, we were going to treat everything. Were we going to discard things? We had to kind of come to an agreement on how we were going to treat these materials. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. 
Um, then another really touchy subject is how to contact the customer because um, the woman that brought the books back with our first one, you know, she just kind of to me lived in a different reality than the rest of us. She mm -hmm. she said that no, she never had any problems and she she didn't see anything wrong with the books. We tried to start pointing out things that we thought were damaged and unfortunately she had several brand new books so she was the first checkout on them. So that in a way helped us know that that yes that this was the the customer that was bringing these in. But um, you have to be really careful on how you talk to customers. Uh, one of our work, uh, workflow policies is, is to actually put holds on items that are still on um, a customer's account if they've returned something that we suspect has bed bug damage. And we had a situation where uh, a woman had several children's items out on her account. Um, the, a book came back that had a bug in it, and, and it wasn't a bed bug, but it wasn't proper training at the time, and so it was assumed that they were bed bugs. So they went through and put holds on all of these items that were out on this woman's account, and then she called the library because she tried to renew them. And after about the first, fifth book she tried to renew, she kind of got a little bit frustrated. So when she talked to a staff member, the staff member looked it up and saw that the next hold on it was for bed bug damage and immediately told the woman, oh, well, it's because you have bed bugs. Mm -hmm. And that just created another whole course, set of problems. Yeah. So you really have to think about you know, what you're saying to customers. Um, and you have to kind of have a script. And we, we do have some things um, out there for you to look at. Uh, we have a, a, a template for a letter that we've developed. Um, it's, it's gone through our legal department, um, explaining to a customer you know, that, that items that they've returned have bed bug damage um, and giving them instructions on how to return them because we really don't want those items coming back into our book drops. Um, then you're going to have to consider, are you going to ban this customer from the library? Um, some, some libraries that have infestations have actually done that. Um, we haven't done that at, ben, at uh, Lincoln City Libraries. What, what we've done is we've charged them for the cost of the item. Our customers can't check out if they have more than $10 of fines. And so far, we've found that to be a pretty effective way to immediately stop them. Most people who have bed bugs have bigger problems than a you know, $30, $40, $50 library fee. Um, so that's kind of what's happened to us. And if we have a, a reoccurring customer that's checking things out, um, getting charged for them, paying them, and coming back. We'll, we'll kind of address that when we have that, but so far we haven't run into that. Um, another issue, are you going to ban personal belongings? Uh, we went to one seminar, and, and there was a, a person talking from a library that had a huge infestation, and they just went to banning everything. They banned bedrolls, they banned book bags, they, you know, they banned a whole bunch of things because they needed to make sure that people weren't bringing in bed bugs on their personal belongings. Uh, we had a situation where an elderly gentleman came in with a messenger bag and sat down at a, a computer terminal and the person next to them looked over and saw that there were bed bugs crawling out of this messenger bag and they came to us and so then we had to go to, we tried to as discreetly as possible go to, go to the gentleman and ask him to bring his, his bag out and um, had to talk to him about, you know, this is what we see and we asked him to um, remove the item. So we've actually put that as part of our policies that um, you know, we will ask people to remove anything that has, um, it's, it's more than just bed bugs, I think it's termites as well, but any kind more of cockroaches, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. insect. Um, but that's something you're going to have to think about, you know, where, where are you going to set those lines? And then finally, if you are going to ban a customer, how are you going to reinstate them? Um, some places require proof of treatment. Uh, most of the over-the-counter um, applications you can get are not effective. Uh, when we talk to uh, uh, people who exterminate these, they say that they're not effective. So are you going to take a, a receipt from you know, somebody who tried to treat it themselves? Um, usually, and, and Jody might be able to jump in here a little bit more, Like usually it takes several treatments in yeah. order for... Um, the problem to be solved, so you have to think about that as well. Um, like I said, we have not decided to ban customers, so we haven't had to go to this step, but if you choose to ban a customer, you are going to have to think about that. How are they going to be reinstated? 
All right, the next, our next item of emphasis then was to talk about staff. Um, all of the staff do, we have eight locations in Lincoln City Libraries, and we felt that all, or, that all staff needed to be trained on how to identify bed bugs, what bed bug damage looks like. That's why I was talking about the poster earlier. Um, we have volunteers that check in books, so we also want to train the volunteers so that they can recognize the evidence in the books and what a bed bug looks like. Um, we developed workflow procedures, um, and that's something each library needs to do exactly. What do you do if you're checking in a book that shows bed bug damage? Um, how do you show it on the customer's record? What do you do with the book? Um, you know, just we've got like two pages of um, instructions that we decided that staff that for staff to know so that they could follow. Um, as Katie alluded to too, we had to talk to them about what to say with the public. You don't say, Jody. That book has bed bugs. You've got bed bugs in your in your home. <laughs> um, there's kinder ways to say it, such as the library has found evidence of bed bugs in your books, mm -hmm. you know, and then be willing to talk to the people. And that's the, that's a very hard conversation to have. You don't know if they're going to react with anger, with mm -hmm. surprise, um, if they're going to admit it, um, just what they're going to say. But just think how you would feel if somebody said, "Oh, we found bed bugs in your books." Um, so we had to talk to staff about that. We had to. We talked about how to pre prevent transporting bed bugs um, from home to the workplace and from the workplace back to home. Um, there's all sorts of precautions you can take. One thing that that we've been told, or that people will talk to, or that professionals do if they're working with bed bugs. Um, hopefully, you have an attached garage. You may want to take all your clothes off in the garage, throw them right in the dryer so that you don't bring them in. That's a pretty serious case, but it's something that all of us have done, and we hope you have an attached garage. <laughs> you might want to think about that. Um, I know uh, Katie has called her husband and said, please put clothes in the garage for me. <laughs> so there's ways around that. But it's a conversation that has to be had with staff um, about how to keep yourself safe. Um, we recommend that you tumble, that you put your clothes in the dryer, skip the washing machine, go right to the dryer and keep them in at high heat for at least 30 minutes or more. Um, and if you're wearing clothes that are dry cleanable, you know, put them in sealed plastic bags. Um, and also if you find, this is what we use, um, two gallon size plastic bags mm -hmm. in the library to put things in too. So if we find books at the circulation desk, um, we put them immediately in one, not one bag, but two bags and make sure they're sealed. So that was another thing with staff. We had to make sure that they all had the bags and knew where they were and, and how to recognize them. Um, and again, some our handouts are attached um, yeah. on the Library Commission website. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on the session page for this show, um, Julie sent them to me yesterday. There's three handouts there where documents you can download. It's their letter, um, their uh, best practice or bed bug prevention, and FAQ for dealing with library customers. Um, so you'll also be able to get those after the show if you haven't seen them out there already. We did not put our workflows on because that's pretty, you know, it's something each library has to determine right. on their own. Um, if everybody wants it, we could kind of edit it to make it kind of generic and put it on if they want. So, um, Oh, and the one thing I wanted to mention, too, is that in Nebraska, at least, we have at least 70 extension offices. So you can go to your local extension office and talk to them. They don't have people in Jody's position at each of them, but they will send pictures. Mm -hmm. So they'll get you the information. They'll get the information to Jody and um, Dr. Jonathan Larson, who works in Douglas County. Hey, in terms of workflows, uh, we went to inspecting every item that came in. And we, like, we trained our staff to know what to look for. Um, so when items come in, um, we kind of do a quick determination if it's obviously damaged. So this would be something that has like the fecal stains on it or the blood splatters on it or something that's very obvious. Or then something that might be suspected if it was just right next to it in the book drop or on a book truck. Um, we, we wanted to treat everything. Um, so um, we just decided that it would be better to treat everything and we'll determine you know, if we're going to charge a customer later. Uh, if it's if it's something that we think we're you know we're gonna tr uh, it's obviously damaged and we're gonna charge that customer, we try to put that charge on as uh, as soon as possible, and that usually prevents them from doing further checkouts. And then the other thing we have to do is go into their um, holds, look at what's you know what they've what they have outstanding on their 
account and any holds they might have and anything that's currently outstanding we put a hold on for bed bug damage and that means that they're not allowed to uh, renew it and then when it comes back and when it's scanned in our, um, our our system shows you know this is on hold for and it gives the customer name so bed bug damage so we've trained our staff to look, really look and if you see it's on hold for bed bug damage you need to be aware that this book you know you should treat very carefully <laughs> get it to the plastic bag <laughs> um, we don't want our aides or anyone checking in to move the book from from that point you bring the bag to, uh, the steel plastic bags to the book and you seal them up then um, and then uh, we also have them uh, whoever's checking it in is is kind of responsible for, for putting together the uh, template, uh, the letter template that we send um, to the customer, and then our um, branch managers are the ones who actually sign those and send those out to customers. Um, so then, once we have them in sealed plastic bags, uh, they go into our freezer for at least four days. And then after we're done uh, freezing them, then they come out, and then we do a post-treatment uh, inspection, and we look at it. Anything that we think is fine can go back into the collection, and those would be usually the books that are just next to a, maybe an infected book will go right back into the collection. Anything that has any kind of damage on it at all gets discarded. All right, these are the things that we use at Lincoln City Libraries for treatment. We started out with a heat treatment oven. It was a large um, cardboard box that heated up to at least 113 degrees on the inside. We would keep the books in the um, double bags. We'd put them in there and um, what we lovingly call the bed bug bakery. <laughs> we would bake them for at least seven or eight hours. Um, the issue with this is that you need to have somebody kind of watch it. You need to start it. You need to stop it. One time I forgot to shut it off and I went home, so I had to come back because I worried about it being a cardboard box. Now they make them more like the soft-sided cooler bags, um, so I think they're safer. And these are affordable options for libraries. This one cost, I think they cost around $140 the last time I looked, so um, I think it's a reasonable option. Um, it's you can't put a lot of books in. You could probably get 30 or 40 in, would you think, maybe, at a time. Um, but then we did some more research and found that you could use, you can freeze the books or the items. They need to be at least in a freezer that goes to a, to zero degrees, and they need to be kept in there at least four days. Um, when I went out shopping for the freezer. The, no, all freezers are not the same, so you know, make sure you ask for one that will freeze to below zero degrees to do it. And this was fairly, I think this one cost around $300, so it's a fairly reasonable option too. Um, the freezer makes it really easy. We keep it in the CERC workroom. Um, if we find something where we're checking in books, we double bag them and put them immediately into the freezer, um, so we're not carrying them all over the library. Um, we do just have one at this time for Lincoln City location for all of our locations. It seems like our library that we're in, the Bennett Martin Public Library, has the largest, we find the largest amount of um, bed bugs in our books. Um, some other things to have are lots of Ziploc bags in the both sizes, the gallon and the two gallon, um, latex gloves. Sometimes it just makes everybody feel better if you wear gloves when you're, when you're handling them, and Clorox wipes. If we find them on, if we're checking in from a book cart and we find a book on the book cart with bugs in, we immediately put the whole shelf, you know, in there, and then we'll wipe down the cart. Um, again, the whole goal is to, you know, you're going to have an introduction of bed bugs because they're everywhere, but we want to stop an infestation. Okay, we also have, um, we're lucky enough in Lincoln to have a company that has bed bug detecting dogs. Um, so Spots comes regularly. Um, and sniffs all of our shelves. He also will do all the furniture, um, tables and chairs, um, and he does alarm. Spots will bark if he smells bed bugs. Um, and they do have a new dog now named Ruby, and she sits if she sees, if she smells bed bugs. I guess they go to hospitals and apartment buildings, and, mm -hmm. and I guess the people in the hospitals were concerned about the dog barking. So um, now there is one, if you have an infestation, you might want to take the books from the top shelves down because they can't sniff all the way to the top, but they can get four or five feet up, I believe, to smell them. So, 
So one of the other things we did was we drafted and published some um, FAQs for the, for the public. So we wanted to have something to say if customers called and said, you know, how are we addressing this? So we have a little script that our staff can say, you know, this is how Lincoln City Libraries are addressing uh, the threat of bed bugs. And one of the things we, we um, emphasize is that libraries are not uh, great environments for them to thrive. Uh, you know, they're usually nocturnal and they need a human host to, mm -hmm. to feed. Um, usually you don't have people in the libraries at night. <laughs> we um, hope not. <laughs> so um, there, uh, libraries, like a lot of public buildings, you know, you can talk about any kind of public building, a movie theater, um, restaurants, you know, you can have introductions, but it's just, they're just not a great place for, for bed bugs to thrive, and that's something that's really important that we, we tell the public. Um, we also want to tell people how to return items. Um, our worst case scenario is when they just come back in the book drop and then they could have infected anything that's in that book drop. So uh, we, we want uh, the customers that might have bed bug infected books to make sure that they're put in uh, sealed Ziploc bags and brought to the attention of a staff member. They shouldn't just be put into a, uh, a book drop. And then we also provide uh, a, a link for finding more information about bed bugs, and this is back to the, the county extensions, uh, their resources there. Are excellent, yes. One other thing I wanted to mention too that um, at Bennett Martin Public Library, we have a garage. So one time we found um, spots alarmed at a, at a love seat we had in our youth services area. Mm -hmm. So we put the, the love seat into the garage for six months at least. So it went through, I think, winter or summer. I can't remember which one it was. Mm -hmm. But then when spots came back, we had them um, sniff it again, and it was fine. That's so, so that's another option. And if you do move furniture around in the library, they recommend, the extension office recommends that you wrap it in like shrink wrap or put it in a bag so that the, the bugs don't fall off as you're moving it. Um, what I've done is have spots follow the trail to make sure he doesn't sniff anything else. So, um, so that's another option too. All right, here's some examples. This is a book that we found when you first opened the back cover. There were two little, we think, blood smears on the side of the book. Um, so that's one of the first things to start looking for. That should raise your um, radar right there that maybe there's bed bugs or bugs in the book. Um, we then looked at the bottom of the book, oh, yeah. and you could tell there were um, fecal spots, blood smears, um, all sorts of things going on with that book. And then we opened up and we looked inside the cover, and there were, you could actually see a couple dead bugs inside the cover. So as Katie was saying, it's really important to take a good look at the books because you want to stop it now. Um, this was probably one of the worst books that we had with, um, what did we say those were, the, the, the blood spots? The fecal spots. Fecal spots on them, yeah. Um, and these were all over the book, and I didn't keep the book, and I kind of wish I would have. <laughs> um, but this was where I first got to know um, Jody because I thought, I'm just going to take this book over here. Because number one, it's good to get to know her, and another thing, let's just figure out what's going on exactly. Yeah. Um, so the extension office has wonderful facilities. They have um, magnifying glasses that or magnifying computers that will blow up everything. So here we are, and see I had to take my glasses off. We were searching um, to look at the things up close. Um, there was some more spots that were on this book. Um, we kept searching and we did we looked at them for a long time. And finally Jody took a pair of pliers or tweezers and picked out something from the inside of the cover, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And this was about the size of a grain of salt. It was very, very small. So, um, and then she put it under the, on the computer screen. And there it was. We found one. And it was not visible. You really not need the visible. right kind of equipment to see it. Yeah. yeah. And part of the reason why I went over is because I wanted to educate myself more. Mm -hmm. You know, and the extension office is wonderful to work with. You know, I'd also say when you're uh, looking at books at check-in, uh, flip through all the pages. Um, what happens if, if a, a bed bug has uh, just recently had a meal? They might be crawling across the book, and we have people that take their, like, index finger and, and push down on the bug. Mm -hmm. And in that case, it splatters the yeah. blood on the pages. So that's another telltale sign that this might be, you know, a book that's bed bug damaged is if you see these blood splodges all through through the book. 
And we don't want to send out a book that looks like that. No. So yeah. <laughs> I keep thinking, you know, if I see spots in books when I'm reading them at home, it's like, oh, what is that? And I'm so happy when it's food. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so these are just some of the things that we do that we've talked about. I think the most important thing is to stay calm. We've shown a lot of pictures because we do need you to get past the itching stage. <laughs> but yeah, I think, I'm getting that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I will, easy. even if, you know, we've had people drop like four or five books on the surf desk and live bugs have come crawling out. Yeah. And I guarantee it, you're going to itch. <laughs> but you need to stay calm and take care of it. So, so I don't know, honestly, Mr. Where do you hire to the, do the dogs, the, the Special bed bug sniffing dogs. I think from. when whatever area you're in, if you do just, just do a search on the internet, mm -hmm. doesn't it like an exterminators type office would do or um, pretty specialized. Oh, okay. Like this this one, this is the top hit if okay. you put in um, bed bug sniffing dog. Ah, okay. So, okay. The dog, it's a ten thousand dollar dog, and it goes through extensive training before they get it. Oh wow. And um, once they get it, then they have to kind of train it how to work in public areas mm -hmm. and you know, how to behave. That's why the last time they came, they bought, they have a new dog named Ruby and she's seven months old, but she's mm -hmm. came and, you know, to learn how to, I said, yes, bring her along because this is a good place yeah. for more clothes to, you know, to learn how to do it. So. Yeah, I did. I just Googled on here, bed bug sniffing dog. And here for Nebraska, the first one that comes up is canine bed bug detection of Nebraska and Lincoln. And then something from pest solutions in Omaha, meet decoy, our bed bug hunting dog. Yep. So they're yeah. around. So we uh, we're glad they come. Yeah. Yeah. And so you know, hiring a dog isn't for every situation, mm -hmm. but in situations like a library or a dorm room, when you need a lot of ground to be covered, investigated, and, and um, you know, inspected pretty quick, um, a dog is the way to go. But when it comes mm -hmm. to like a bedroom, you know, it's you you do want a human to to go and confirm and put sure. things over. And this is something we can tell our customers that we do quarterly. Yeah. We check all of the libraries. And we should also say that it's a line item in our budget now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. You know, to hire the dog. Yes. The to, to, pay for, yeah. to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> and you always learn a lot from them because they're telling you about where they found bed bugs before and, and what they do to prevent them. So it's mm -hmm. a good time to have a good conversation. Yeah. We do have a couple of questions come in. Um, so if anybody does have any other questions, type them into your questions section of your GoToWebinar interface, and we'll grab them here. Um, someone wants to know, uh, first, for um, obviously Julie and Katie, when you talk to people in the library, do you take them away from the desk to a private place, you know, try and keep it, you know, Absolutely. Private and on the down low. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Go back in the office. So. Mm -hmm. And it's probably something you've dealt with with other situations with, with uh, customers that you've got to... Let's go off somewhere else and talk. Yeah, nobody this. wants to, you know, to overhear a conversation that, oh, yeah, <laughs> we found that. Bad, so. Yeah, and we've also had to tell staff that that's not something that to talk about, like, you know, where, mm -hmm. yeah, there's a lot of, you know, when we're, we usually have two people at our at our uh, customer service desks, and so, you know, that's not something you should be talking about just in general. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to give the uh, the wrong impression to people that are in the library, and then you you don't want to, you mm -hmm. know. Offend well, the person that that might be. Yeah, and right. staff are busy. It's like you know, mm -hmm. so, and this takes a lot of sensitivity. So. Yeah. Um, so uh, another question. I see this is for you, the pest control person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> said that bed bugs can live up to a year without eating. Um, that is, is true. true. <laughs> I I would say that is is true, but it also depends. So mm -hmm. that would be an adult bed bug, and they could. I don't. I don't personally know. I know scientific. Like scientists have said up to a year, but that would be like a bed bug that's not, you know, actively searching for food and, ex, mm -hmm. you know, expending energy that that may, I mean, I definitely, I think six months they mm -hmm. can. So when people want to leave their premises, like I'm just going to leave for a year and come back and the bed bugs will be dead, right? Well, <laughs> not always the case. Yeah. So that's probably what the pest control person was saying. Um, they've done different experiments with, with other um aged bugs but the smaller ones they need they'll they'll dry out if they don't get a blood meal pretty fast mm -hmm. they need that they'll moisture be, they'll be dead yeah not just dormant. right so the little yeah. ones so i mean an adult the little an ones. adult, <laughs> an adult bed bug, i think it can live quite a long time without a blood meal so yeah unfortunately that's true so you really want to actually have it treatment yeah. done yeah. Not so it's just something don't avoid it you yeah. want to <laughs> yeah yeah 
Um, and as well as wants to know for you guys from the library, which what staff is on your bed bug committee? Who do you have on the committee? Or where are well, they from? Or? <laughs> it it started out with um, I volunteered to be on it, and then we had another librarian that volunteered to be on it, and then at the time. Um, the uh, person who does our like our damages we when we have mm -hmm. items that come back into the library that um you know are damaged we have every branch has somebody kind of assigned to to kind of deal with w deal with that so he he joined the committee um i'm trying to think who else was on it initially i think um, just another you know we've got we have kind of a flattened organization so we've got mm -hmm. library aides library service associates and then um the library service supervisor and librarian. So we had the library service associate, mm -hmm. you know, join us. People that are at the front line desk and work with them. Mm -hmm. So basically, you know, see who will volunteer right. <laughs> that wants to, yeah. Because it, you know, I think I was I was there like shortly after. I think they called me to come up. Um, but what, you know, when when you see what havoc this could wreak, you know, you wanna you wanna be there and you wanna say, okay, we need to find a better way to deal with this. So that was kind of what, one of the reasons that I was doing it. And I think I was a library service supervisor at the time, mm -hmm. so I was in charge of the library service associates. Um, but when you when you have somebody bring in six books and the bugs start crawling out, then you yeah. you understand that you need to have some mm -hmm. procedures in place. Mm -hmm. We took this person outside and. You know, he put all of his books on top of our book drop, and and I had a you know kind of a quiet chat with them, and he agreed to take them home and freeze them, and then bring yeah. them back in bags. So yeah, that's the thing. You've got to the the panic. I mean, because people hear bed bugs now that you hear the horror stories of going to hotels mm -hmm. and things and coming back covered, and I'm sure when people hear that or see that um, staff, they just mm -hmm panic and run. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Potentially they could because they don't want to, yeah, bring it into their own house. So, yeah. Well, all of us, we still talk about it if mm -hmm. we find them. And, oh, sure. And it's like, do we take mm -hmm. precautions? <laughs> and I always have, we always have luggage and laundry in our garage. Mm -hmm. Before he even goes into the house. Yeah. And I, when I was the supervisor in charge of the aides, um, I always told the aides because they were the ones primarily dealing with check-in, you know, make sure you're wearing something that you can throw in a dryer. Don't you know, mm -hmm. don't bring anything really, really nice. I I try not to wear a lot of clothes that are dry, you know, dry clean only, but on yeah. days when you're presenting to the public or something, I'm, I might be in it and it's usually those days where <laughs> and, and I would say it comes in waves too. Like we haven't had any in quite a while, but it seems yeah. like we'd get like three or four from different mm -hmm. people in one month and then mm -hmm. it would drop off and six or seven months would go by and we'd get another batch. So mm -hmm. it's Kind of That's it, actually somebody had just asked. I'm jumping down. How many incidents have there been since 2014 when you had the first? Oh, I don't. Thing. We haven't really kept track. No. We have um, the bed bug. The spots comes, you know, four times a year, and right. I bet that, that he has found all of the libraries at least 50 percent of the time. He's alarmed. Hmm. You know, that for for either a piece of furniture or a row of shelves mm -hmm. books. So they're there, and you just don't know, and then you just take care of that section, mm -hmm. and yeah. Um, so that's a question for Jordy, I think. If a single bed bug is brought into a home, if that's even possible, will it die off because it will not be able to breed? Like, it is possible one to, just... to bring one in on your shoe or your purse or something like that. If it's a male bed bug, yes, likely it will die because it won't be able to breed. If it is um, a female that has already mated, they only need to mate once. They mm. actually, all most insects can store sperm. Oh. So they just need the blood meal to be able to lay eggs. So if you get a fertilized female, that one bed bug can, can, can create an infestation. Then, yeah. So yes and no. <laughs> It'll depend. <laughs> yeah. Better to be okay. cautious. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whenever you see anything, definitely. Um, Okay, here's a good, good, good uh, policy question, I guess. If you decide to keep a book in the collection that has been treated, so you didn't have to get rid of it, t toss it, do you still charge the patron for it? Do you have like do you pass on for the cost of the treatment? How does not well? Out? Since our treatment is really just putting it in the freezer for four days, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, no. Um, it, what's no what's being for returned to the collection is something that looks, you know. A, ni a nice book, like, and it, it's usually what's being returned to the collection is something that might have been right next to on, on a book mm -hmm. cart or in a book drop, 
right, right next to a book that was in, you know has the damage pretty much anything that has damage we get rid of right away our, our normal policy with damaged items is to leave them available for a customer to come in and inspect them you know when we charge them and then they if they pay for that then they can take that item with them we don't do that with bed bug books no. you know they the customer doesn't get a chance to see them they go right out to the trash yeah outside okay. of the building yes yeah. yes mm -hmm. And the ones that you treated are the ones that were just nearby and don't have any visible mm -hmm. damage so that you can still mm -hmm. uh, re Like the one picture we again. showed with the spots, mm -hmm. you know, we don't want those to go back in the no, collection. You don't, like you said, you don't want anybody to see that. You're right. just grossed mm -hmm. out about getting icky books from the library. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I would say that's true for all damaged books. I mean, the, I so. you know, kind of the, the rule of thumb is would I, would I want to check, take, check this out and take it to my home? And if, mm -hmm. if I'm looking at a book and it's kind of, you know, because mm -hmm. we have people that, leave food stains on stuff. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that comes back with library awesome. books. Everybody knows. <laughs> you know? um, so, you know, anything that we wouldn't normally put back on a, mm -hmm. on a shelf, you know, we're not going to put back if it's, you know, right. it's been treated. Yeah. And since the treatment doesn't cost anything extra, there's no reason to charge someone just because it was nearby and right. did get to you. But we're doing that, that to protect the integrity of the library, right. too. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, it's the only things that are are, are obviously damaged mm -hmm. that we charge a customer. Yeah, makes sense. Because then you got to totally replace it potentially. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do. All right. All right, we're just hitting 11 o'clock, which is great, perfect timing. You guys are worried about going too far <laughs> over or something. Yeah. Um, anybody have any other questions? Any last minute questions you want to get out while we're here? Um, you can see there is contact information for everybody, for Jody, Julie, and Katie up there. If you, I'm sure if you want to contact them afterwards, any other questions you come up with, you can. But if you want to ask anything right now, this is your last chance. Get your typing in there. <laughs> um, any last uh, final wrap-up things you guys want to say before we do? Well, I it's certainly nothing I ever studied in library school. I think <laughs> no one, but you know, it, it's it's out there and it's not going to go away. Mm -hmm. So the best thing you can do is learn to you know have these policies in place, know how to handle them when they come in, know how to you know have your staff know how to um, be trained to identify it, mm -hmm. you know, have the staff know how to protect themselves, and um, you know. It, I don't itch as much, <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. and you know it's just another day, you know. Okay. I would agree with Katie as uh, and then as the manager, it's like I want to make sure the staff are trained. I want to make sure the customers are handled, the books are handled responsibly. That we talk to customers mm -hmm. responsibly, um, and we just have to do it. We have no choice. So. Yeah. It's too bad that you have to get you actually end up getting used to it yeah. <laughs> because it's come up often enough. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and we've never had an infestation, so that's kind of our goal. That's good. Yeah, you know, exactly. Is, is to not have that. Mm -hmm. Do as mm -hmm. much preventative as you can, yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, it doesn't look like anybody typed in any urgent last-minute things, so I think we will wrap it up for today. Um, thank you very much, Jody and oh, Julie and Katie, for being here today. Is um, uh, Very informational, very good, um, very itchy, but I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, just you know, mental kind of thing. Um, oh, and someone asked, where can we download documents? Actually, I'll show you that right now because I'm going to grab back the mouse here. Do -do -do that. And we're going to switch over to our website here. Um, so, yes, we've been recording the show right now, and it will be on our website. If you just Google Encompass Live anywhere, um, we apparently have the only thing out there called this yet still, which is great. So we come up first on your search results. Uh, the information for today's show, it's already bumped off of here, but I can show you the uh, items that uh, Julie sent me yesterday are on the session page right now. Um, you can download them right now from here. Uh, FAQ, best practices, and the letter that they have for a template. You can use those. You can, they're all downloadable from our website. They will also be included when I send out the link to the recording as well. We should be copying this right over to our recording link, which will be available here on our Encompass Live website. We've got our current show, upcoming shows, but right beneath that is our link to our archives. And this is where we'll have a link to the YouTube recording of the show. It'll be right here at the top of the list when it is done. This is last week's. Um, a link to the PowerPoints that they both shared today. And um, those documents will all be there as well. Um, probably by later this afternoon sometime I'll have the recording done as long as YouTube cooperates with processing and uploading and all. And you'll all get an email to let you know when it's available there. 
Let's see. All right. Um, so that will wrap it up for today's show. I hope you join us next week when our topic is something completely different. No bugs, I hope. Um, and, <laughs> and archives and special collections. Actually, you never know. Um, but I don't think that's what they're talking about next week. Um, new, they're working on some new standards for um, public services and archives and special collections. And um, Amy Schindler, who's from UNO, she contacted me about doing a presentation on about this on the show. She's going to be on next week talking about what they're looking at, um, looking for comments on it still. And she's bringing along a couple of colleagues. Um, Emil Hardman from Harvard and Christian DuPont from Boston College are going to be on the line remotely with her for next week's show. So please do sign up for that one. That's for just Nick on next Wednesday. And any of our other shows, you see we've got our topics coming up for the next um, couple of months here. New ones are always being added. I've just got two, two confirmed for March so far, but other ones will be coming in. So Take a look, keep an eye on our schedule there. Also, if you are a big Facebook user, Encompass Live is on Facebook. We have a Facebook page. You can like our page over there. We put notices of when a new show is coming up, when recordings are available. No, I don't want to log in right now. Thank you very much, Facebook. Um, uh, so if you are big on Facebook, you'll get reminders there. Here's where I put in a reminder to log in on the fly for today's show. So if you want to like us over there. Other than that, that wraps up for today's show. Thank you so much, all you guys, for coming over today. And thank you, everyone, for attending. And hopefully we'll see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye. And we are...